Hello again, everyone. My name is Sarah Clark, and I am the Assistant Trade Show Manager here at CIPH. Welcome to today's Outlook Economic Forecast webinar presented by CIPH and HRAI. I'm pleased to note that we have just over 350 sites registered across Canada for today's session. Before I introduce our webinar presenter, please note that you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of today's session. You can do this by typing your question directly into the question box you see in the webinar control window on the right hand side of your screen. Please save your questions for the Q&A portion at the end of the session. If you are having difficulty with the system, please click the raise hand icon and I will send you a personal message to help you out. Also note that a copy of today's presentation will be made available to all attendees following the webinar. You will have the opportunity to submit questions after the session has ended as well. Today's webinar presenter is Peter Norman. Peter is Vice President and Chief Economist at Altus Group. Altus Group produces a publication for CIPH and HRAI called the Outlook Quarterly Economic Review, which delivers timely economic insights, housing market data, and commentary and analysis of trends in non-residential and infrastructure investment by region in Canada. Peter is a well-known professional land economist and forecaster who is widely quoted in the Canadian media, media and is a frequent expert witness on economic matters. He also consults for private and public sector organizations across Canada, providing economic intelligence and strategic advice. Please welcome Peter Norman. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for that introduction. And thank you everybody for uh, joining us uh, uh, on this call. Um, uh, it's another another six months have passed. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, we all met up here in order to hear what my remarks were on the economy about six months ago. And at that point in time, I was reporting on what it was like eight months into a pandemic. And now we are well well past the one year point and, uh, and still going strong, I suppose. So today I'm going to be kind of focusing my remarks uh, as per normal on issues kind of affecting the economy and in particular, obviously, uh, the kind of uh, recovery we're having, et cetera, and then talk about implications on uh, the construction sector through uh, kind of demand driver factors uh, for both the non-residential and residential space. Um, and perhaps along the way, we'll talk about a few few other things as well. Um, I'll just give a, uh, Sarah had mentioned off the top about the publication. I'll just give you a bit of a reminder that that here it is. I hope that you're still pulling it up every quarter and taking a look at it. Um, uh, we have a, a number of pages in there that kind of go through some regular indicators. Some of them are uh, re very regional focused, if that's what you're interested in, and, and some of them are national focused uh, in order to give a, a broader context. We always have a kind of a qualitative uh, uh, economic review article on a different topic at the beginning. The most recent one, as you can see, is, uh, is, uh, is about new home sales and how they can be a, a great leading indicator for us understanding uh, how things are going in the construction sector. Um, I'm going to share a few kind of detailed remarks about, about that topic near the end of my presentation today, um, just to kind of give you a little bit of a flavor for, you know, some of the detailed stuff that we look at uh, uh, in terms of that kind of leading indicator. But as you can see on here, we've covered other topics such as um, uh, oil, you know, oil price shock. Uh, the, uh, uh, well before the global recession, we talked about the, uh, the the potential impact of a global recession, and uh, and and we usually uh, touch on ICI construction from time to time as well, which of course is all very important. One of the things that we present in the newsletter on a regular basis is our leading indicator. We developed this leading indicator uh, for CIPH uh, a number of years ago, and we continue to report it. It does tend to be uh, a fairly telling indicator. We tend to pull together as much of the uh, data points that we think give a, a good forward look on, on, on activity in the construction sector all together in one spot in order to try and give an idea about balance. And sometimes it's a bit higher and sometimes it's a bit lower than as you can see. Now we've just come through two quarters where this leading indicator is actually quite strong, which of course is reflective of, um, of economic 
of the of the path of economic conditions. In fact, two two quarters quite strong after a quarter that was quite negative. In fact, both you can sort of see collectively those three quarters are lying way outside of the norm for this indicator over you know over the many years that we've been tracking it. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about that as well. But that's obviously indicative of the of the type of uh, economy that we're looking at. And so. Um, just moving into the presentation material, I'll just say that there's kind of three three kind of dominant uh, themes. Now, on my cover slide, you might have saw that I that I titled this um, this presentation "Choppy Waters," uh, which is a cautionary term. Um, in fact, sometimes choppy waters can be a little bit frightening when you're when you're in them and you're in your and you're out in a boat, particularly a small boat. Um, uh, but they're not necessarily dangerous waters; they're choppy waters, and and that's exactly the kind of economy that we're in right now. So uh, the economic recovery from the recession that we had last year, the pandemic induced recession, has been very, very strong, but it is, it is uneven. It's uneven by sector and it's, uh, and it's showing uneven spurts and starts depending on you know, the continued uh, progression of the, of, the, uh, of the health crisis and the, um, and the on again, off again containment measures brought in by various provincial governments to respond to the, to the subsequent waves, so the waves of, uh, of, uh, of threat from the health crisis. So it's an uneven recovery, even though it, in, on net it's, it's very strong. Uh, Non-residential construction uh, investment has been lagging uh, and it faces longer term challenges. So we're gonna spend some time talking a little bit about that. And then on the, on the residential side, housing demand, of course, is very buoyant. It has been very buoyant uh, in recent months um, and right the way across the country as well, which makes it a kind of a unique time because we often have housing uh, uh, that's not always a, a national phenomenon. Uh, but the supply conditions are, 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 are very tight and are posing severe risks and uh, through various channels. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well as we weigh out what things are like in these choppy waters. I will say that very early on in this pandemic, somebody I, I'm stealing this analogy from one of my colleagues, but that somebody used an analogy that the, um, that the uh, effect onto the economy of the pandemic is a little bit like taking a beach ball that's floating and then pull it uh, pulling it and holding it underwater, uh, and that, of course, was the the sharp downturn during during the second quarter last year. And then, of course, releasing it, and of course, it floats up to the top of the of the uh, uh, to the tops of the surface of the water very quickly, and in fact, overshoots. Uh, and then, as it lands, you get a lot of splash, you get a lot of waves, and people get wet. Uh, so it's not a it's a recovery. Uh, but it's not always a recovery which is controlled and it's not always one that's even and, and we're in that period right now where there are a lot of waves and splash and uh, and we're not fully out of those uh, those um, uh, unusual conditions yet. Just going to start a little bit large as I as I often do in order to give you some context for the shape of you know economic growth going forward and I and I'm showing you kind of you know IMF numbers for the world economy overall way over on the uh, left hand side of your screen and you can get a sense there about how the economy shrank uh, an almost unprecedented three over three percent three point three percent of the world economy uh, in all of 2020 which uh, you know which is a very dramatic decline but that's being more than compensated for uh, by the growth of about 6% this year. That's a forecast number, of course, but, but uh, as it progresses through, uh, 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 there are expectations that, you know, that, that on a world basis that the, that the pickup will uh, make up for, the, for those declines. Um, of course, you know, there's high uncertainty. Those are the words of the IMF itself. And, and we could see that, that number pushing off further into 2022, more in 2022 rather than 21, if, uh, if in fact, you know, conditions, particularly as we're seeing emerge in India now and, and elsewhere, uh, really put the brakes on, uh, on the, on the uh, advancement in the global economy that we've seen in the last uh, number of months. But nonetheless, this is the view uh, uh, right now, or at least sort of in March from, from the IMF, and I don't disagree with it. And you can sort of see that that's mirrored very much in the, in the uh, consensus outlook for the US economy, which you can see there. And of course, our outlook for, my outlook for the Canadian economy, which you can see uh, uh, has a fairly similar shape, even though Canada's uh, economic contraction last year was a lot more severe 
uh, than than we saw in the world economy as a whole, and and more severe than the U.S. economy, and bear that in mind, much more severe. Um, but that we're uh, you know we're also participating in a fairly rapid bounce back this year. We expect uh, growth to be around six to six point two percent. Now over on the right hand side, I've, I'm sharing this kind of new view, which I think is is a little bit indicative of the of the uncertainty of the forecast environment as we go through. Uh, this is just the IMF's forecast for uh, for this year, for 2021, uh, and as they uh, presented it at different forecast times. And you can see back in January 2020, this was prior to, well, at least prior to the pandemic being declared, although uh, there, there was already, uh, you know, knowledge that it may be coming. They had expectations of about 3.4% growth, which is a normal, pretty much a normal year of growth for uh, for the world economy. Um, and then as we got into March and April with the severe contraction in 2020, their 2021 forecast was for quite rapid recovery around 5.8%. And then as as the length of the uh, of the lockdowns, et cetera, kind of continued, they got more and more negative about growth this year. And then after October, once the vaccines were approved and starting to roll out, they got more positive about the growth for this year. So it does give some sense about how the how the the uh, expectations for economic growth and 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 as and how it's playing out very much uh, for this economic growth this year and as we go forward, very much is dependent on you know the. Uh, conditions in the health crisis itself, and of course, uh, you know that the emergence of the vaccines, the pace at which the vaccines are rolling out, and ultimately the effectiveness of those vaccines, which of course itself continues to be a to a, 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 a there's a small amount of unknown there in terms of the longevity with which those vaccines will work and how fast we'll be able to boost them and all that kind of thing. But right now, there is a, a fair amount of optimism in terms of the way that it's rolling out worldwide and and. And, and as the economy will move through this period. Now, just moving down into Canada a little bit, looking at the employment situation, uh, this very much does also give an idea about, about uh, you know, how, how our recovery is shaping up. You see that sharp decline when we lost about 3 million jobs. Many of those jobs came back last summer. Uh, as you can see, job growth kind of, uh, kind of peaked out in the, in the fall. And then as we went into the second wave, uh, things kind of deteriorated. Uh, and then they started to improve into into March. Now March is sort of the beginning of the third wave, and we'll probably see, you know, as April data comes out um, uh, later this week. <laughs> this is a poorly timed presentation in that respect. We'll get April data in a couple of days. When April data comes out, we'll probably see that April took a, a step back again, just because of the uh, you know emergence of of more lockdowns across the country uh, related to the to the third wave. But nonetheless. Overall, at least to where we are right now, uh, about 90% of those jobs that were lost have now been recovered. Of course, cautionary statement being that those last 10% are, are kind of the most difficult jobs to recover. They're the ones that won't come back until there's really, you know, really uh, a, a lot of normality in terms of the way that we, uh, the, in, in terms of the way that we can interact uh, uh, in in our communities and therefore the uh, the ability for those kind of high touch occupations uh, like uh, restaurants and um, and bars etc and uh, theaters uh, that they can all come start coming back online fully and then of course you know cautionary statement that we need to start consuming again in patterns that uh, were similar to what we consumed before and that still is a, a bit of a question as well I mean, is our as an example is our retail spending that we have successfully shifted very quickly to online retailing will it uh, you know at least partially or mostly reverse back to spending in our in our communities and in our stores and uh, and supporting those types of jobs so we will see how that all plays out but nonetheless uh, met, many of those jobs are now recovered you can see that provincial I'm not going to go through the provinces but you can see that you know BC has certainly fared a lot better in terms of that net recovery uh, and the prairies are probably the worst overall uh, along with kind of Quebec as well as uh, as as not fared that well in terms of the pace of, of uh, employment recovery, but uh, but we're but everybody that unevenness as well is is characteristic of the unevenness of, to which the the health crisis has affected various uh, uh, various provinces. And um, just a slightly uh, different view of GDP, just to give some some idea, because that was a very general one. Uh, or, 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 or sorry, GDP is. Uh, in addition to the employment numbers that we sort of talked about. And you can sort of see, I mean, those 
those strong gains in GDP were mostly last year, but we're still looking about looking at uh, you know. Uh, relatively strong gains through uh, at least the second half of this year um, uh, on a quarterly basis and the net effect on an annual basis will be that 6.2 percent that we talked about before. Coming back to jobs for a second I just wanted to make one kind of stylized fact from from this chart and sorry if it's a tiny bit hard to interpret but on the left hand side we're looking at the pace of employment growth month by month by month since the beginning of the uh, pandemic and I mean it is what it is it, it follows a little bit that pattern that I that I showed you uh, in the in the more normal chart earlier um, but on the right hand side I'm looking at the hours worked the actual hours that people are working so you know you could have employment uh, 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 decline uh, a certain amount but uh, there have been times in this pandemic when the actual hours that were worked by individuals fell a lot more than employment because people may still have been employed but their hours were cut back and conversely during the recovery uh, you know people gained hours who who may not have even had lost their jobs originally and so there's a lot more volatility on hours worked and that plays to the, the you know the increased volatility through this period that sometimes just those top line employment numbers don't you know kind of mask as well so that's a kind of a stylized fact that I like to uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, 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 point out as well and I just want to transition now into um, into uh, the construction sector and, and how the impacts are so uh, first first just to kind of get our uh, our bearing on things um, uh, on the right hand side I just want to kind of remind everybody of what composes the the construction sector uh, the non-residential construction sector represents uh, about 20 29 percent of construction investment in uh, in Canada and and the majority of that is commercial construction which would be your office and and retail primarily um, uh, entertainment uh, facilities stuff like that so generally public serving uh, types of facilities and then you have uh, industrial that plays uh, a role and uh, institutional and government type construction as well plays a role um, and then the the major the rest of it the 72 percent of uh, of construction spend is is residential residential really is you know the lion's share of the construction sector and at least in the view how I've kind of showed it here it's relatively split between you know single detached units and and multis I later on I, I tend to tech talk a little bit more about apartments versus single family but um, but this is a kind of a view that shows singles versus multis and you can see it's generally split between between those two uh, the renovation numbers are all uh, baked into there they they end up being the biggest renovation ends up being the biggest part of those of those uh, residential numbers uh, overall the residential uh, you know the residential numbers are about 140 uh, as you can see there about 140 million billion dollars and uh, and it's closer and it's closer to 80 billion dollars which is uh, uh, which is the uh, uh, renovation numbers that are embedded into there so renovation very important residential very important uh, within the non-residential sector the commercial sector is the most important now looking over on the left hand side there you can see the trend on on commercial investment where we saw you know a steady rise a steady and and, and healthy rise in uh, in commercial construction, particularly through the 2018-2019 period, and then it contracted um, modestly into 2020. Probably, perhaps not as much as you, you know, you might expect, but it did contract kind of modestly uh, there, at least on an overall basis. And then in the first quarter, uh, or sorry, we don't have the full first quarter data yet on here, but the first two months, which uh, give us an idea about the first quarter, you can see there's even more of a contraction, almost a 14% contraction overall and a lot of that uh, is coming out of commercial. In fact, if I uh, analyze commercial a little bit stronger here, you can see that the commercial, you know, the, the volatility on commercial is a little bit, is really driving that overall uh, non-residential uh, number. We're looking over on the left-hand side there, you can see that commercial construction in April fell a lot faster than overall non-residential. It also started to come back faster, but then when things started to turn down again, uh, for non-residential construction in general after that kind of brief you know pent up you know return to return to projects that happened after the after the initial lockdown um, in general we're seeing that commercial investment trending down over the last number of months that of, of course the lockdown 
the decline in construction was simply because sites were closed in many cases uh, for a number of weeks in many parts of the country, and then um, construction sites, and then that comeback, of course, were just those sites opening up and trying to make up some time, et cetera. That's why we saw that growth. And then really that trend decline in both in the uh, an overall non-residential construction, but led by commercial construction, which is your offices and retail again, uh, really coming from that kind of uh, lack of confidence in terms of taking on new projects, delaying projects that were in the pipeline, uh, delaying CapEx on, on existing uh, buildings. Uh, where, uh, the leasing activity is down, so the TI, the, the tenant improvements that go on in inside office buildings has, uh, you know, that activity has obviously uh, declined quite a bit because there aren't a lot of people moving into new office buildings or moving into uh, uh, new space in office buildings, et cetera. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a view that there is a lot of office in the pipeline uh, ready for construction. Um, there is about 20 million square feet uh, of office space in Canada right now under construction. Uh, of course, we have some some concerns right now about the about the um, viability of all that space, but generally speaking, once it's under construction, it's going to come come to market. So we will have a situation where, you know, somewhere around 20 million square feet will be coming, coming to the market that's under construction now over the next uh, several years. But there is some uncertainty as to as to the degree to which there'll be demand for that space, uh, particularly as we're seeing some you know, some adjustments in terms of uh, companies' need for space as they uh, as they rethink uh, how much of their workforce will be in the office at any given time now that uh, remote working is a slightly, well, it, it, so we've gone through a period when remote working has been a, has been the reality for most companies and a lot of government departments. And then it, as we move into that post-pandemic period, there's uh, continued questions about, 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 uh, uh, how much of those trends might continue. Um, I sus I'll, I'll share a few points on that a little bit later, but in general, uh, it's not gonna be completely back to normal. It's gonna be some other uh, place in, in between. It's not gonna be exactly the way it is now, and it's not gonna be back to normal, but somewhere in between. But either way, I think we'll be kind of setting office demand back by you know, probably at least five years in many markets. And, and that's at a time when we have a lot of space coming to market. So we will see you know, uh, things look rougher in terms of office space performance as all that new space comes to market and vacancy rates rise. Uh, I am also pointing out on here that in addition to that 20 million square feet, there's nearly 40 million square feet of offices, uh, office construction in the, in the pre-construction period just being planned. Uh, now, there may not be much of that that actually gets started, um, but some of it will uh, for projects where it makes some sense. And there's also, um, you know, uh, uh, some of that is already pre-leased, so there's already tenants waiting for, for, uh, for new, new buildings to come forward. So some of it will come forward, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's, it's a continued part of the risk that there's a huge amount of space in this kind of pipeline. Uh, I wanna switch a little bit to retail and talk a little bit about the demand factors. I mean, people might think that retail is in, you know, really, you know, really dire shape. And we certainly have heard a lot about that, but it's a more complex answer than that. Retail spending actually is very robust right now. Um, uh, retail spending certainly took a, took a hit during the lockdown period in, in early 2020, as you can see there. In fact, it fell quite precipitously for about three months uh, in a row. But since that point in time, it's bounced back very quickly. And it's, uh, and in fact, through most of the second half of, for all of the second half of 2020, we saw retail spending on a month by month basis well in advance of, of its normal levels or where it had been a year before, or two years before. Uh, and the first two months of 2021 has continued that same trend. We see retail spending up very strong in, in February in particular, January and February combined, uh, very strong, much stronger than last year and, and the year before. So people are spending, um, but they're just not, um, they're just not spending inside stores as much, obviously. There's a lot more uh, online shopping uh, that's taking a, a, a chunk of that purse. And again, post-pandemic thinking, uh, there will be you know, a, a, a bit of a reversal. There'll be less of, the, of, the, uh, of this spending going through online channels, more going through bricks and mortar channels. But the retail sector itself, it's kind of, you know, in, has been in the midst of transformation between bricks and mortar and, and, and online for quite some time. And this just really represents a, a continuation of that. Um, it may have been an acceleration, but a continuation. Uh, bricks and mortar stores, for instance, uh, often serve as terminals for, uh, 
you know, for either pickup or or even just a, a, even just transfer of uh, of goods that are being that are bought through online channels. And so there continues to be, you know, a, a life for bricks and mortar retail going forward. It just may not be exactly on the same path as we had prior to the to to the pandemic. Um, one thing I will say, I was talking about retail there. But if you want to look at restaurants and bars, it's a much different story. I mean, this is a sector which, I mean, it has been literally decimated in terms of the, you know, level of spending uh, on it in, in some components. It fell in April. It started to recover in the in the summertime as there was a lot of kind of patios and so on and so forth across the country. And then in the fall, it started to decline and it's been very, very weak in January and February. Um, uh, on the right hand side, there's a little bit of differentiation, obviously. Fast. I mean, all components of the of the food services uh, uh, sector have uh, have seen you know extreme uh, declines in in revenue, but there is a little bit of differentiation. Less of those decline amongst kind of quick service foods, fast food, uh, where you know they've been able to pivot very quickly to the uh, takeout and delivery model, um, and uh, and for full service restaurants, a, a lot more of an impact, and for pure bars. Uh, a, a, a much more severe impact as you can sort of see through coming through that thing as well. So um, I suspect again post pandemic that these will be um, these numbers will reverse very very quickly. This will be one of those examples where uh, where we see things come back very quickly um, but it has to be more of a full recovery before we see that that come back quickly. So the timing of that is is pretty hard to uh, to, to do. Plus, there's going to be capacity issues, right? We have lost a lot of companies that uh, a lot of restaurants, a lot of bars have uh, have closed, and a lot will open very quickly when things come back as well. But the turbulence in that sector may also uh, play to the ability to um, uh, to competently invest in and build new space, which is sort of what we're concerned about here uh, uh, in that uh, in that restaurant and bar sector. It, may, it might. This whole thing might have really set us back again, probably three to five years in turn, well, three to four years in terms of our need for hospitality space. And so we need to bear that in mind as well in the construction forecast. Um, on retail sales, I, I won't go through this, but just to sort of say that, I mean, they are up 6% overall uh, so far this year. Um, they were down on a year over year basis last year, but as you saw, that's just the composition of it. But overall, it's, it's not, it's still varied quite a lot. Um, uh, uh, clothing and apparel still uh, very, you know, very, very weak in comparison to what it was before. And you can see there's a, a distribution of experiences for other types of goods. Mostly, I just want to focus in though on on the one which is building materials and some garden supplies. I mean, that's the one which is uh, which is which is um, which has surged ahead. And of course, that's uh, that's driven uh, largely off of the renovation sector and off of the DIY sector. So I'm gonna share some comments about those sectors in a couple of minutes, uh, particularly when I get to the residential section. Um, but anyway, bear in mind that one of the upshots of uh, the renovation surge that we've been having lately has been this, you know, almost 30% rise in the beginning of this year over last year in terms of sales through the Home Depots and Ronas of the world. So anyway, bear that in mind as well. I uh, just want to switch back to office for a second just to underscore some stuff. I have showed you this chart before and it does help us to understand how conditions are deteriorating in almost every market. We continue to have actually better conditions in Halifax for some reason. That's been a that's been a trend throughout the uh, pandemic actually where things have actually improved in, in that one in terms of the office performance anyway but in every other market particularly the markets of Vancouver and Toronto which of course are well, and along with uh, Montreal are our, are our largest office markets in the in the country, and all three of those have seen fairly significant deterioration in the in financial conditions. So here we're looking at the vacancy rate. I mean, vacancy rate of you know around 15% in Toronto is something that hasn't been you know seen since uh, the early 1990s, uh, and uh, and is and 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 can be a troubling sign. And this, of course, is kind of real vacancy as well. Uh, this is a uh, you know, this is the availability of spaces is ready, ready to be ready to be leased um, uh, uh, right now. So empty space. Another uh, view of that is a sublet space. And so what component of that empty space is sublet space and sublet space just to kind of, you know, tune you in is where, you know, if I'm if I'm a company and I have a, a head lease for 10 years on a space, but I, I no longer need that space, I'll try and lease it out to you and uh, rather than the landlord leasing it out. And so this is 
when these bar when when this indicator turns this much this is really a sign that there are widespread number of companies or tenants across the stock that are reducing their own space needs and therefore have additional surplus space that they're trying to find a, a subleaser for uh, and so the fact that these are turning up so quickly across the way is really a, a, a pretty cogent view into the post pandemic world in the sense that um, you know, we're looking at companies that are now making five and 10 year decisions ahead and saying, we don't need that space. So this is an indication that we might see, you know, a, 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 peer, a, a prolonged period of reduced office need, particularly again, in those larger markets, the ones that drive the national numbers, Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal, all of those markets, particularly Toronto, have seen, you know, very sharp rises in the sublease market. And that's something to, to bear in mind. I'm going to switch a little bit, starting to switch a little bit more now into households. Uh, population growth, uh, obviously, very important for uh, for all activity in the residential sector, whether it be renovation and or new homes uh, and or home sales. And uh, and this is, of course, you know, one of the hallmarks of the of the um, of the pandemic period has been the very very sharp reduction in the rate of population growth. Um, and I'm showing Canada, I'm showing a couple of our larger provinces as just as kind of examples. I didn't want to sort of put everything on here uh, and, and clutter it up too much. But as you can see, the trend is the same almost everywhere. Uh, population growth in Canada overall, we had uh, over half a million uh, person growth uh, in 2019, and that was down to under 150,000 person growth last year. That's a dramatic change. And think about it, population growth drives uh, household need. And so if our household need is typically around, you know, 200 to 250,000 households per year to support half a million people, then uh, we need a lot fewer houses to support growth of 150,000 people. So the longevity of this reduction in population growth is a very germane question as we try and think about post-pandemic period. Uh, obviously, it's the migration component, the international migration component, that darker bar, which is driving this change. Um, the uh, natural, the births and deaths component, uh, natural growth is uh, is typically very stable. Uh, so the, it's really a question of how fast migration comes back. And on that question, the the, uh, the news is pretty good. Uh, I've been tracking um, just one component of international migration. There are, there are others as well. Uh, but one of those components, which is a pretty important one, is the admission of permanent residents into Canada. And we've got this data by month, so you can certainly see how, you know, in April of last year, it turned almost right off. Uh, uh, we stopped admitting permanent residents pretty much completely, except for, you know, a handful of cases. And then and then it was really, you know, it did vary month by month, but, but significantly weaker than normal numbers through most of the second half of the year. And the good news is, is that when you look at the beginning of this year, we actually have admission of permanent residents now back, at least in January and February. I think once we get into April, March and April, when we started to get the travel restrictions put in place, we'll see this number softening again. But at least in March and January and February, when conditions were still fairly open, uh, we saw this number actually return pretty, pretty strong. So um, there's more troubled waters ahead, I think, in terms of in terms of the pace with which we'll have uh, uh, international migrants coming to to Canada over the months ahead. But I think this is an indication that when conditions do get better, the tap when the, the tap will turn on again. Uh, and we have had indication indicators from the federal government that uh, that they're going to be um, using their, their policy environment in order to try to boost uh, migration, international migration as much as possible, at least in the short term, when things are safe to do so. And they've done so already with one policy measure, which is to, um, which is to accelerate the rate at which uh, non-permanent residents who are currently in the country can apply for and, and get their permanent residency. So that would include students and some other factors like that. And, um, and that's the first measure. And they have also uh, talked about upping the targets for um, just uh, new, new intake as well. So we'll see how that all plays out. But this is a kind of a, you know, a cautionary and a good news story as well as we go forward. So I just want to transition now into residential components of the construction sector. And the first, of course, is renovation. And I, I'm starting with this because it so dramatically shows pandemic effects at work. Uh, we saw renovation activity drop quite precipitously in the second quarter, uh, as many renovators were not allowed to attend to their to their sites. Many homeowners were not contracting renovators because of, because of uh, lockdowns in those early months of the pandemic. 
And then as we moved through the summer and, and fall of last year, conditions opened up, uh, protocols were put in place in order to get uh, work done. And, and more importantly, and perhaps, well, importantly, and perhaps more importantly, is homeowners' uh, desire for renovation started to explode. And, uh, and that came obviously from, from, sorry, those came from some obvious pandemic effects, including, you know, the idea that we're just sitting at home <laughs> looking around at, at our four walls and figuring out what needs to be done. Uh, we're doing a lot more than, of that than, than when we were going into our offices. Secondly, we're, you know, um, massive amounts of Canadians were, found themselves working at home and wondering about how long that would, that, that might last uh, in whole or in part and uh, thinking about ways of fixing up their homes in order to work in them better and uh and and thirdly people just had some time on their hands and and time on their hands for a canadian typically doesn't take long before so having time on your hands turns turns one's thoughts to diy and i and i think all of those things were at play as we went through the latter half of last year and the beginning of this year is is no different uh, activity is very very strong um, now this is having a big implication, I and mean, we were seeing prices of of materials uh, going through the roof. I mean, the price of lumber has nearly tripled uh, as we go through this period. As a result, uh, uh, almost excludes. Well, I mean, there's a number of factors on on lumber demand, but uh, but uh, a lot of it is the uh, is the is the, sorry, a lot of factors on lumber price. A lot of it is the demand that's coming from the residential sector, residential renovation sector. I'll kind of remind you that. Um, you know, I did say earlier that uh, that um, amongst residential construction, renovation uh, represents about you know almost 60% of the overall spend, but it's it's almost 70, almost a little over 70% of material demand. So about 70% of materials that go into residential construction uh, flow through the res the renovation channel rather than new home construction. And so when it starts to surge, it really does have an impact on on the balance of supply and demand balances in some of those materials uh, uh, sectors. Um, I'm not going to spend time on this chart, but just to kind of, maybe you just kind of like gloss your eyes over to the right hand side, but it's basically sort of to say that, um, you know, when you're looking at uh, activity last year on renovation, I mean, there were declines on the year as a whole, almost all the way across the board. Uh, oddly, in in the prairies, not so much. We saw residential construction up in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, although from low levels, it had been lagging in Alberta. And non-residential construction as well was up in in the prairies, um, but almost everywhere else we saw residential and non-residential down last year, and almost everywhere we see a residential up this year and and non-residential continuing to be to be down and down by fairly large amounts. I mean, uh, uh, fifteen to twenty percent across the board. Uh, so far in the in the beginning of the first quarter of uh, 2020. We will have our next um, national construction activity report that we produce for CIPH uh, coming out just in about two weeks time actually. We're uh, we're producing it on the 15th of this month, so it'll probably come out a couple days after that. Um, and that will have the the uh, that'll have the data that'll have the the uh, data up until uh, March, the, the full first quarter of data in it, and then we'll have a pretty good idea about where we're going in terms of of these uh, these numbers uh, uh, for the rest of the year. Um, I don't want to say too much about interest rates; <laughs> they are what they are. But what I will say is that the uh, is that the sharp decline in rates that were evident uh, early last year, right after the onset of the pandemic, uh, were largely responsible for the surge in first of all in renovation spending because a lot because a lot of renovation activity is financed, and secondly, in terms of new home or, or resale home demand. Uh, because uh, the sharp change in interest rates really, really changed the the, uh, the profile of affordability for a lot of um, for a lot of potential home buyers, and uh, and that showed up in terms of uh, home buying activity in the in the sp in the summer and uh, and fall. Uh, but what I will say, and why I have this here, is that rates are starting to retrace. Uh, and on the bond front, they've entirely retraced. All their pandemic effects are out. And on the mortgage side, we're about halfway retraced, but continuing to rise. And so a lot of that pandemic stimulus, both on that would affect both rent renovation and new home demand, at least on the financing side, uh, pretty much is is on its way to retracing. And I think that's those are important factors for us to remember. And then I just want to move on to net, to home sales. This is a resale market because it it gives us a good indication of uh, the way. Uh, the sentiment of, of housing across the country. Uh, 2020 was our strongest year for resales ever in this country. 
um, and that's a pandemic year. I, I started off in March and April. I would never have believed that this could have been the case, and this is really the way that it played out. Really, really quite remarkable, and that and that momentum continues. The first quarter was the very strongest first quarter we have ever seen, and by a by a mile, as you can see there on the chart as well. Very quite remarkable, uh, and perhaps you know if you look on the right hand side, just to just to think about that that. Uh, that monthly pattern of sales as well. I've talked in, in other data that I put up or other sectors or other you know, economic aggregates that I've shown you so far in this talk. I've talked about how there's been a real uneven uh, activity. I mean, some, you know, you look at those employment numbers, you look at the hours, do you look at even retail sales and others, like you've got some months that are stronger and some months that are weaker, even migration, everything. Um, and yet that's not the case with home sales. It started to come back strong in June and it's been uh, strengthening, strengthening, strengthening. Um, uh, almost a record, uh, you know, performance in every single month going going forward. Uh, perhaps only November was there a was there a step back, um, and it seems to be immune from the second wave, and it seems to be immune from the third wave of the of the pandemic. Even though the first wave obviously had a had an impact. So, you know, this is this is something to watch. Um, I, there was a lot of stimulus that came from. I guess pent up demand, at least from the initial thing. There were uh, there are demographic factors that are pushing young people into well, not even not so young people, the older millennials, as to say, uh, away from their apartments and towards single family homes. And the pandemic really released a lot of that that underlying demographic demand. The sharp change in interest rates uh, improved the affordability situation, at least in the short run, for a lot of potential buyers, and all of that contributed to what we've seen over the last 12 months in terms of well, eight, nine months in terms of uh, in terms of this early surge in, in home sales um, now prices have you know changed very dramatically since then and I'm showing you that now uh, across Canada I mean I can't think of the last time a national number was plus 20 percent we've had certainly multiple markets small markets where it has been but for the national number to be plus 20 percent on a year-over-year -year basis is unprecedented and um and it's and it's a and it's a all boats rising with this particular dubious pro, uh, uh, tide i should say um across the country i mean no market i'm showing a like a scatter plot of markets coast to coast everything is uh is is up uh, on a year-over-year -year basis from the price level and prices of course in housing maybe i don't need to remind you is all supply and demand uh, i've talked a lot about the demand factors but the supply factors uh, are what are what's leading to these these crunches um, housing supply is what we like to sort of call inelastic it's you don't you can't just produce a house instantly when uh, when demand shows up it's if it's a if it's a new unit it, it takes sometimes it takes years to plan for that unit and then to get it built and everything and if it's a resale unit there's only you know you've got to have a find a willing buyer it's a willing seller out there and and that doesn't turn on a dime either so when you get these surges of demand you'll always get some spiking of pricing um, and some of those spikes will come back down again as uh, demand, as supply starts to to adjust in one way or the other. But right now we're definitely in that spiking uh, kind of period. But if you look on the right hand side, part of the underlying story on this as well is that real shifting in in demand preferences between uh, you know uh, condo apartments and uh, and uh, single family homes. And it's the millennial generation we're watching very closely here because. You know, it's first of all, it's a large bulge going through the population. Um, it uh, it's a it's a it's a generation that that drove a lot of the condo apartment demand uh, while it was strong in uh, in the late 2000s, early 2010s, uh, mid 2010s, and um, and now that tide has really turned on that. And I think the pandemic has released a lot of the that underlying demographic demand. But too, you've got your oldest millennials approaching 40 now, and those and and we know. I mean, you can go back to any period of time in Canadian history. I mean, you know that once people are in their uh, getting into their late 30s and early 40s, they are you know uh, uh, 65, 75 percent likely to be you know in a single-family home as opposed to an apartment. So people are making that move, and that's showing up, and that releasing is showing up in terms of the the price pressure. The price pressure is all on single-family homes, not so much on apartments. I will note that the condominium apartment numbers I'm showing just Toronto and Vancouver, which are two important markets for that are not below water we're not we're, it's not a market that's uh, that's in a lot of distress but there's certainly a, a lot of the a lot of the wind has come out of those uh, or a lot of the air has come out of those balloons uh and and we're not seeing a, a lot of uh, activity right now um 
uh, in that apartment side, but it is more of a single family story. I just wanna, I did hint at that at the beginning um, about the, um, you know, about new home sales and how it, how it, how, how we can kind of use them in order to get a, a good sense. I, I will stress that new home sales, I mean, they're only generally about one out of every six or seven home sales that take place. I mean, most most home sales are, are resale. Uh, the resale market is uh, is the majority of, uh, of, of the way people buy their homes. But new homes obviously play an important role in terms of contributing towards housing demand because that's what that's our building of the new of the stock, and as our population grows, we need to build the stock. And obviously, it's important to us uh, who uh, feed in, you know, whether it's economic analysis or whether it's uh, uh, plumbing and, and heating or or or, or air conditioning units uh, into the, into the market. You're concerned about the building of new stock as well, and uh, and so that's and so new home sales, which typically, you know, well in many cases, well in advance, or happen well in advance of the actual construction, uh, give us a pretty good leading indicator. And they also give us an indicator about about some of these trends. And so I spoke a little bit about the single family versus apartment shifting going on in the resale market, very evident in the resale market, and that's also the case in new homes. So we're looking just at Toronto numbers here. I mean, the, once we start talking about new home sales, it, it's very much a local story. Um, so we have to look at different different localities. But Toronto is an is an important and large uh, uh, home sales market. This is Greater Toronto Area, so, the, so a broad, broadly defined geographically. Um, but very strong activity last year, just under 40,000 units. You can see that's not the strongest year uh, ever, but it's uh, but but it's but it was stronger than 2019 or 2018. Um, and uh, and that strength has continued into the into the first quarter, where we saw you know almost uh, 11,000 uh, units sold just in the quarter alone, a little bit stronger than it was last year. But all of that strength is really coming through on single fa new single family home sales, and you can see it was 17,000 last year, uh, five over 5,000 in the first quarter, which is well in excess of the first quarter of last year. And on the flip side, in terms of condominium apartments, still you know, still represent about half of the sales, but nonetheless, it's uh, really coming down from those highs of a few years ago. And that, um, you know, slowly declining momentum as well is moving into uh, into the first quarter of 2021 on apartments. So it really is kind of reinforcing some of that some of that story. Now the new home sales have been have been surging on the single family side, but supply is very, very tight. Um, we have less than a month of supply in the greater Toronto area as an example of lots to sell. I mean, you can't, if you don't have a lot that's approved for sale, uh, you can't sell a lot. And if you can't sell a lot, you're not gonna build a home for a, for a, for a home buyer. And uh, those lots are down to a, only a month of inventory. And uh, and you can see that's what's had that big impact on price. So we have prices pushing towards 1.5 million for a new single family home in, uh, in, in the GTA. We saw prices accelerate a lot back in 2016, 17, when we had another supply crisis. And we thought things had kind of, we turned the corner and things have gotten you know, a lot better since then. But, uh, but the pandemic and the real surge and demand for single family is really showing up in terms of draining those inventories. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I do find this one very interesting. This uh, uh, um, this is just kind of you know uh, four different views of the pipeline towards uh, new uh, towards getting that supply. So uh, in order to get supply of homes to sell, uh, first of all, you have to have a, a, pr a housing project. You have to have a launch of a of a of a new of a new uh, subdivision. And uh, so that project has to come forward, or either a new subdivision or a new high rise, uh, um, you know, a, a project. If that, that uh, project have to, ha has to get approved and it has to come forward and then the lots can be sold and then those, then we can build on them. And uh, this is showing that on the low rise side, uh, only 37 uh, projects came forward in the first quarter. In fact, if you kind of look over the, over the last three quarters, it's only been about, you know, about 140 units in total that have been 140 projects that have come forward. And those 140 projects have accounted for about 5,000 lots. And we sold 5,000 lots in one quarter alone. So it's showing how the pipeline just is not strong enough to bring new projects forward fast enough for people to buy. So that's a little bit of a risk factor. We see a lot of demand for single family, but we don't, we're not gonna be able to supply them quite as fast as, as we want. Uh, I will say that land sales, like underlying land sales, this is an earlier part of the pipeline, have been accelerating. There's almost 5,000, sorry, there's almost $5 billion worth of uh, land sales in 
uh, sorry, um, I, I'm, I'm going to back up a second there. This is not the land sales. This is now Vancouver, and this is now unit sales. And so it made, in Vancouver, we've seen a similar trend last year, uh, started to build a lot of momentum into the end of the year in terms of the number of, uh, of unit sales, uh, home sales in Vancouver. And, and it was strong for single family, but also for the apartment products. So it's a slightly different story than what we saw in, in Toronto. But part of that is because actually the, the high rise product in, in Vancouver was very weak for a couple of years. I'm only showing the last kind of year and a half of data here, but if you go back two or three years, uh, the, um, uh, it, it was it was stronger before about 2018 in terms of that high rise product and it, and it kind of collapsed and now it's been building back up again through the through the pandemic and then but on the supply side you know similar story to Toronto we've seen those um, uh, we've seen uh, those uh, oh, that's the same anyway the supply is also constricting for for Vancouver. Uh, I just want to share uh, a thought about construction costs, which which create a real risk for bringing housing forward right now. Uh, now in Toronto, I'm also showing commercial on here. So whether it's apartments or singles or even commercial construction, even though commercial construction isn't very, isn't a lot of strong demand for it right now. We are, we are seeing spillover, I, I think from residential and it is posing a risk for uh, commercial construction as well. But with costs that are in that kind of 15 to 20% range on a year over year basis, that might be a spike that we you know, would expect to turn around pretty you know, over a while. But some of this is materials, some of this is contract cost of uh, trades, et cetera. And uh, some of it is the excess cost of um, compliance with social distancing measures on site and the like. A lot of it is supply chain interruptions on materials, um, and, and it, everything points in the same direction. So it's a big cocktail of factors. Uh, but the main thing is coming out of it is a big risk. We could have all the demand in the world for new units, but if the cost gets so prohibitive that uh, that it's hard to plan for, to build and to sell those units, then uh, then that creates a bit of a risk for us. I'm showing that Vancouver is a similar story on uh, construction costs for residential, but not so much on the commercial side. So it does vary a little bit across the, across the country on that side. So now I'll just finish off um, with the forecast. Um, forecast is usually at a high level anyway in, in your publication and this shows, shows what we're talking about. Um, we're looking, if you're kind of on the right hand side, 2021, we're looking at pretty close to about 240,000 housing units. It'd be a pretty, quite a strong year. I mean, I think I didn't actually count this up, but I would say that, um, you know, if I had data going back to uh, the 70s or so, this would be sort of one of the one of the five highest years of, of, of residential construction as a result of that. Um, this graph kind of shows five bars at the beginning uh, in on each of the panels uh, to give you a five years a piece. So it'll give you a 15 year time frame just to sort of show that, you know, where our typical uh, production of housing is, which is somewhere, you know, in around 200,000. And over the last five years, you can see the individual years there. It's also been kind of nudging up just above the 200,000 up to the 210,000 range. Um, uh, but on, on the left-hand side, very much you see those stark changes. So as we move from the early 2000s through to you know the most recent data, we've seen this real trend from apartments being a kind of a, a small minority of production across the country uh, up to you know being being the majority in the last couple of years and really my forecast is for that to kind of very slowly turn around it's still mostly a 50 50 uh, um, um, uh, side of things but really start to slowly turn around uh, we're going to see this some of these trends on single family that I've been speaking about really kind of take root. Um, we're also gonna see slightly broader uh, locations for housing demand as well with some of the um, you know, continued pandemic effects, which is which has seen migration of some home buyers, some people in general moving from uh, from more dense urban centers to slightly out slightly outlying ones. Uh, that of course, you know, creates a need for housing in those outlying areas. It creates a need primarily for single family housing. We're going to see that uh, take root. So I won't go through through this, but you, but but allow you to just kind of take a look at it, and I might leave it up just as we move into into questions because it gives a sense of what we're looking at province by province um, in terms of the housing forecast right now as well. So Sarah, maybe I might just turn it back to you, and uh, I know we're getting near the bottom of the hour, but if we've got a few minutes for uh, questions, I'm I'm always happy to to uh, do so.
Great, thank you so much, Peter. Um, like Peter said, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the uh, questions or the chat box on the right-hand side of your webinar control panel screen. We do have a few questions, Peter, that I did send you before the webinar. Um, oh, I, oh, yeah, I, oh, so I forgot to address, no, I didn't forget to address them. I, for, I forgot to address the fact that I was going to address those. Um, I, I, those two questions had to do with when are when are people going to fly on airlines again? And the other one was when is the border going to open? Um, and I must say it's beyond my expertise to know. I mean, but the answer to both those questions is, you know, very much about the about the longevity of this health crisis. And while we all kind of expect it to get you know to get better with vaccinations quickly or whatever, um, you know, to be able to to be able to peg when the federal government will uh, alleviate border controls. Um, you know whether that's in the months ahead or whether it's not until next year. Uh, that's a that's a difficult thing to to point to now without having a good sense about that 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 path of the of the virus and the variants and and all the rest of it. So I would say you know think positively and uh, and plan conservatively on both those fronts. While uh, more questions are coming in, I just wanted to reiterate that the presentation is being recorded and will be sent to all attendees afterwards, along with a survey. Um, so just look out for that within the next couple of days. But we are having some questions come in, Peter. First question, why the higher increase in costs for commercial construction in Toronto than Vancouver? What factors are increasing Toronto so much more? Yeah, I'm not certain if I know the answer to that. I was a bit surprised by the data myself on on that front, and I have been having some conversations with some of the cost consultants to try to drive underneath that hood a little bit. Um, but a lot of it really comes down to the pricing power of the trades. And in Toronto right now, um, there's there's just so much activity on the on the residential side that it's drawing a lot of the trades in, and I think that that you know that 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 leaves you know that leaves more pricing power for those trades that uh, that are continuing to be in the commercial side and in vancouver and until recently like until the last you know few months anyway uh the res the high-rise residential side has been a bit more subdued um in in vancouver for a few years and i think that there's less pricing power by some of the, some of the trades and let and then that will spill over into non-residential that might be about as good as i can say on that um, i think those are factors that that play into it certainly and, and the questioner might be assuming this as well embedded in the question certainly to the extent that there are you know building materials price increases that are leading to some of these construction cost increases and we know even on the non-residential side where wood isn't it, such a big factor we know that copper is you know is through the roof right now uh rebar is uh prices are very high as well uh, and in fact, any you know any any uh, a steel product is uh, is elevated. So you know you should be seeing those show up, but a lot of it really does also have to do with the pricing power of the trades. Another question, Peter. When do you believe the condo market will rise? I don't know if it's ever going to really rise again. Uh, I, I, well, what I will say. Um, and I won't make this too market specific, although, I mean, when you're talking about the condo market, you are mainly talking about kind of Toronto and, and Vancouver uh, primary, and Montreal primarily, and then to a lesser extent, kind of Calgary, uh, and, and then some other, it's Calgary, Ottawa, and some other mid markets. Um, uh, what I will say is that Canadians generally don't live in owned owner-occupied apartments. That's that's not a characteristic of Canadians. It's never been a big characteristic of Canadians. Um, we have, uh, we went through a period in the, in the kind of late 2000s and almost an aberrant period, uh, at least statistically speaking, uh, where we did see a, a kind of a rise in those uh, oldest millennials um, uh, buying apartments basically and that was when there's a fair amount of affordability in the condo sector and that was sort of the first time that we've really kind of seen that and that drove a lot of a lot of trends but of course they've moved out of that trend the younger millennials didn't take didn't take up the um the uh the uh condo ownership trend in the same way they they responded very much they, they acted more normal for their age and and rented and that's that's been driving a lot of the rental uh, demand lately and generation z is coming through and there'll be a rental uh, generation as well uh just because of the affordability issues on on condos um so so i think that you know if you're planning on 
a market full of owner occupied uh, condos, that's not a that's not a thing we're going to see a lot of demand for. Now, on top of that, what we have, what has been important uh, over the last 15 years, is the fact that um, the condo market supplies a lot of the rental market, and that's done through investor condos. So that's been a huge chunk. I mean, that's like in Toronto, that's been uh, you know two thirds of the market in, at, at times. Um, and and that part has been important, and that has been a big driver of condominium apartment projects because they sell out to investors or or largely to investors, um, and then investors rent them out. And we have had a lot of rental demand. Rental apartment demand has been on the upsurge for for the last 15 years for a variety of, of reasons. Um, but what we are seeing in many markets now is that the emergence of um, professionally managed purpose-built apartment buildings is now is now growing strong. So, you know, we had more than 6,000 uh, new apartments uh, come to market last year in Toronto, for example. Now that's representing a pretty big chunk of the rental demand. So, so the, we're gonna see this continued shift where rental supply is gonna come more through professionally managed rental properties, less for through the investor channel. And so both of those things will spell less um, activity and need in the, in the traditional condo sector. We don't have as many owner occupiers and we won't have as many, you know, as many opportunities for investors because they're competing more heavily with the purpose-built sector. And, and those, those comments apply to Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal almost equally. So we do have quite a few questions to go through. Um, I'm just going to let everyone know that we are going to be going uh, to about 2.45 Eastern time. And then afterwards I will connect with everyone and make sure that uh, Peter is able to answer all the questions that you have. Uh, the next question, do you have housing completes estimates? Yeah, actually I don't have those in front of me. The, the completions is what we say. And, and these are, I mean, in our forecast, we typically talk about starts. So that would be when, when, a, when a construction gets, construction of a home or an apartment gets started. And a completion is is when it's finished and ready for occupancy by by an individual. And so, you know, depending on on what product you're selling into that process. I mean, if it's if it's uh, concrete, it's generally you, you want to the start because that's usually when your product is being consumed. And if it's uh, drywall, that's usually you know somewhere in this you know in the middle. And uh, and if it's a and if it's a, a plumbing fixture or something like that, that's generally very near the end. So uh, in our in our services that we provide to uh, the industry, we have a, our Construction Starts publication, and you're looking at a page of that right now uh, that I know a lot of you probably subscribe to already. We do a high-level summary of this in the in the in the uh, um, in the quarterly document we send out to you guys. Uh, but this is a very detailed document on starts, and we have a similar uh, document as well that looks at the same kind of breakdown, but by completion. So that's that's certainly all done, and and we estimate that out based on the typical time frame for construction uh, for you know, the different types of uh, units and in the different markets, so each have a different formula. With supply chain disruptions and product shortages, are your housing forecasts taking these issues into consideration? Well, I've used the word risk many times when I was giving those forecasts, and that's basically what risk means, right? Um, you know, a forecast is a, uh, is a, is a best guess where things are going to go. So we've got demand, uh, we've got supply, and both of the both demand and supply, there are risks around it. I mean, the the demand risks right now uh, have to do with affordability because uh, you know because uh, because prices have changed so so quickly, and the supply risks uh, include those those costs that the questioner is asking about. And so um, so this is a kind of a best guess of how it will play out. I would like, I guess, to give you sort of an example. Um, you know, I have this surge of construction this year, as you can see, at about 240,000 units. Then I have it going back down to a what you might call a kind of a normal number, but it's you know anyway, we back down to around 215,000. And I think that if there were no supply constraints right now, that if we could just bring on, you know, uh, any amount of of construction to meet demand. That we would have those numbers in excess of 240 now for two or three years because because there is a because there is a, a lot of pent up underlying demographic demand. So it so I would say that those those supply constraints, the idea that you know that uh, it's hard to bring 
lots forward through the pipeline. I tried to kind of, you know, illustrate that with a couple with an example in Toronto. Um, it's hard to uh, ramp up supply chains of materials in, in many cases. Um, labor can be an issue on construction uh, as well when you're when you're trying to ramp up. And I just simply don't think that we've got the capacity to build, you know, 240,000 units uh, in in Canada consistently for you know uh, for very long. So that's so I think those those risks are embedded into into the forecast. Another question. This is in regards to the new home build sector. Do you think that the supply and demand issues will persist? If it does, will that lead to large amounts of inflation? So is the question you're asking about housing prices? Is that what they mean by inflation? Or do they mean inflation across the economy, like, uh, you know, like for goods and services? Um, I'll have like to Like inflation clear. the way we think about it, like, you know, with a, at the grocery store and everything. Is that what they're asking about? Uh, we'll have to clarify. Um, so we'll see if the questioner. Um, well, I'll, I'll address housing prices yeah. to begin with, and, and then I'll, and I'll address both. Then, if that if that helps. Um, you, no, I, I, the housing price thing will not continue in the way that it is. Um, some of that plays to what I was just sort of speaking about. That uh, you know that it's a bit unsustainable to uh, you know uh, 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 to um, it's a bit unsustainable anyway to to continue on with such strong demand with these supply constraints. That's what's creating the price increases. And the price increases themselves are, 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 are a result of that, of that, of those supply shortages, right? So eventually what happens is, you know, some, uh, prices increase enough so that, you know, affordability just chokes right off for the average buyer. Uh, interest rates have risen, as, as you know, so that's, uh, that's contributing towards it. And then we'll see that kind of pull back at least until, you know, until affordability improves again. So. No, I can't. I, there, it can't be the the fact that if you've got housing prices going up twenty percent, that you're going to have you know two more years in a row of another twenty and then twenty because uh, because there's no way that housing can consume that much of people's budget basically. Like that's the one way to put it. So I can't see. I, I usually what happens when prices go up is something breaks and the markets adjust in some way. We hope that that adjustment will be a kind of a, what we call a soft landing on prices, which is that they just kind of flatten out for a little while until market fundamentals pick up again. But it can also mean market adjustments going down. You could have prices falling, you know, mo modest amounts as well. Um, I will address just the general inflation question. I don't know whether the questioner was asking about that or not, but I didn't speak to that. But it is a it is actually a topic of discussion right now. There are, you know, we, we are starting to see the inflation numbers pointing upwards because of the, you know, the rapidity of the, uh, of the, um, of the uh, of the economic recovery, and we have a thing right now in terms of data, which which are coming out uh, recently on inflation, and 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 that will affect us for the next several months, which is called base effects, which is to say that you know all inflation numbers now are this month versus a month a year ago, and a month a year ago was in the in the worst of the pandemic, so a lot of prices like for gasoline and others you might remember were quite low, so so that will make inflation look higher than it actually is. Um, but the underlying drivers of inflation, uh, which are usually like consumers' expectations and workers' expectations for wages, we don't see those inflation expectations there. And that's usually what drives up long-term, you know, underlying inflation, inflationary pressure. And that's just simply not in the, in, in the work. So we've got high prices for assets right now, and that would include houses and stuff like that and stock market. But we also have deflationary effects on you know, a lot of goods and certain services and stuff like that as well. So overall inflation expectations will continue to be, you know, more in that 2% range going forward. I'm interested in forward looking projections on the Canadian dollar and associated tailwinds. Dollar has been surprisingly stable through this pandemic, I must say. I mean, I think I would have also expected it at least to have a lot more, a lot more fluctuation. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a rise just in the last, and a little bit of strengthening in the dollar just in the last few, in the last few months. But it's been very, very stable. I don't call the dollar, um, and that's why we don't, you know, we don't show it here in terms of our forecasts. I usually, I consume forecasts like anything else. But the last time I looked at my kind of consensus uh, of bank forecasts for the end of 2021 and end of 2022, you know, we they continue to still be in that 75 to 80, 80 cent range. Um, on the U.S. dollar, and um, and 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 it, and it's showing a lot of stability. So you can kind of take that for what it's worth, because 
I find that dollar forecasts are always that way. They always kind of, they always just kind of gently trend up or gently trend down from wherever they are, but never, but the reality is that usually, usually they, when they do change, they change in spikes. Um, but my, but anyway, what I'm reading right now is that it's mostly a, a stable doll. It's not a, it, there's not a lot of shift in the dollar uh, in, in the cards right now. That's not a, a, a major uh, concern that economists have. Are there trend of changes in construction regulations derived from COVID lessons learned? I don't know if I'm the expert on that. Um, although it's an interesting question, and I think it's probably something I'll try and look into. Um, I think what the questioner is asking about is, I mean, we pivoted our construction sites very quickly about a year ago towards COVID uh, safe practices. Um, and I'd say at 95% of the case or 99% of the, the sites, I think that they have been very safe um, and, and conducted that way uh, for the demands of, of, the, of the disease as, as we knew it at various times. And those practices have migrated as we've changed our understanding of the disease. Um, I think that once we, I think if we get into a post pandemic world where that particular infectious disease is no longer of any concern, um, then we're back to, you know, just worry about general infections and, and we don't tend to have a lot of worry about that. So, you know, will construction practices all go back to the way they were or will some of these um, pandemic safety measures continue to be in place? I suspect it's one of those cases that most things will start to revert, you know, back to where they were. But, you know, um, but, but, but some of the, if there were innovations that were brought in, particularly if they were technology oriented, like for instance, you know, um, a, a use of uh, technology in order to better schedule the pace at which trades come onto, onto the site and uh, interact in the units and stuff like that. There, there has been a lot of gains this past year on sites, uh, you know, in terms of using technology in order to do that kind of scheduling, et cetera. I suspect some of that will still continue to be in place because now that technology is in place. But I suspect most practices will kind of go back to, what, to the way they were before, um, as that's the way, you know, those are the tried and true techniques. This will be the last question that we're going to cover today. So if your question did not get answered, um, you will be receiving an email from me. So that way uh, we can connect you with Peter to get your question answered. The last question for today is why the big fall off in 2022 on single family starts in Quebec? I think the question should be why the big ramp up this year? <laughs> Um, and the and and actually the the fall off is is you can sort of see all the way across. It's a similar. I mean Ontario is pushing out a little bit further. I think there's going to be a little bit more legs to it. But in general, I think that a lot of some of the pandemic effects that have pushed people from urban centers out to more outer lying areas have put a lot of pressure on the need for new homes in those uh, in those areas, uh, particularly single family. And that's pushing up those construction numbers for single family. And that's showing up in particularly in Ontario uh, and Quebec this year. I just think that you know, a lot of those Quebec municipalities are gonna be more successful at bringing forward those those homes in this time. A lot more use of uh, modularization in, in Quebec. Uh, supply does tend to uh, respond more quickly to demand. And in Quebec, there's not as uh, stringent, particularly in the, in uh, in the in the kind of markets we're talking about, not as not as stringent uh, uh, building controls as uh, we have, for instance, in the growth plan in Ontario. So I think that it's more that we've got this surge in demand in both provinces, and more of it's going to be uh, built in Quebec right away. Uh, more units are going to come forward, and then it's going to get that, get back to a to a more normal level after that. Whereas in Ontario, we'll probably see about a year and a half of elevated single family and then then it will start to get back to normal as we get through this like this internal migration effect thank you so much today peter for your presentation and thank you so much everyone for sticking around for the questions as I always stated, a pleasure 
as I said at the beginning of the presentation, a copy of the recording will be sent to everyone within 24 hours, along with a short survey, just to let us know how you enjoyed the presentation today. If you have any questions that you think of after the presentation, please send us an email at info at CIPH.com, and we will be more than happy to pass those along to Peter. Thank you so much again, Peter, and thank you so much, everyone, and have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye for now.